Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Welcome back to America's Heroes Group. In this segment, we are globally connected with Kaiser Health News. January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and today is Saturday, January 29th, 2022. Our host is Cliff Kelly. My name is Sean Claiborne, Army National Guard veteran. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And we have a panelist on the line with us today. His name is Mark Kreidler. He's with Kaiser Health News. He's a correspondent and a freelance writer. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing well. How are you? Pretty good. I read the article that came out. Um, it, was, it was very, very interesting. And, and what we want to talk about and kind of dig into, do a deep dive into the crisis over COVID and also our nurses and how they're being treated, some of the concerns that they have, what's going on in the, in the, in the healthcare industry, and what are nurses and people in the healthcare profession doing about it? Well, it, I think to start, I guess we have to, you know, take the one step back and acknowledge that these are highly unusual times. Uh, without a doubt, uh, those in the healthcare industry, and particularly nurses and and other uh, frontline health workers, are at this point uh, frayed to the edges. Again, two straight years of of essentially pandemic emergency response has worn down uh, nurses and nursing staffs, and I think um, to be very specific, they've also just simply lost numbers. Uh, right, they've they've operated through two years of declining um, availability of nurses and and of healthcare staff in general, in part because they're constantly exposed uh, and have been constantly exposed to uh, to virus and disease um, in ways that that even nurses in uh, such places as intensive care units have never been before. So first and foremost, you know what's happening right now, like as we have this conversation. We have to place it in that immediate context. Kind of bigger picture, though, what's been happening is that for years and years now, nurses have slowly been leaking out of the system, out of healthcare systems. They have left um, hospital jobs. They have left health center jobs in increasing numbers. Um, there appears to be not so much a shortage of nurses, but a shortage, in, particularly in, in registered nurses or RNs a shortage of, of RNs willing to work under the conditions that they're finding um, in a number of hospitals, healthcare centers, health, and health industries uh, around the country. So we're, you know, what we find, I think, is if you're in an emergency situation, God forbid, you may find yourself in a healthcare center that's already uh, understaffed and that may or may not be able to deal with every emergency in its path in you know, in sort of that immediate crisis time that we we would all imagine uh, would happen if we went into an emergency situation. This sounds pretty scary. I mean, it sounds. I mean, you have healthcare. You would. I mean, it's the, the bedrock of our success of our civilization. If we don't have successful, thriving hospitals when people get sick, and especially in the middle of a pandemic, that seems very uh, disheartening of, and, and kind of scary. Well, it is. I, I mean, I, it's not not to sugarcoat it. it. It's really scary. And I think one thing I learned, I've been writing about, uh, you know, COVID and the pandemic for the last two years. And I've I've interviewed, you know, beyond this story, I've interviewed at this point, probably hundreds of of healthcare workers uh, and, and in particular, hundreds of nurses. And I think the, the, the biggest uh, to me, the takeaway that was really the most sobering is that even in these, you know, incredible times that 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 you know, hospital systems and health care systems and health insurance companies have continued to operate, you know, as a profit driven business. Mm -hmm. And as much as we think of the, uh, you know, the doctor being able to see the doctor being able to get health care as just sort of a basic thing, I would go so far as to say a human right. That's clearly just not at play. And anyone who's found themselves in a situation where they have either poor health insurance or no health insurance knows what I'm talking about. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a profit driven industry, and in in many respects, what you're seeing right now uh, is a, especially in nursing uh, a, a a number of professionals who simply say, "I won't work um, in a system that is completely geared to profit." Everyone understands that hospitals make money and, industry, and, and health centers make money. But when money is the decision-making factor, and that actually affects how nurses and doctors 
uh, and technicians and telemetrists and everyone else care for their patients, um, that's when the, sort of the rubber meets the road. And that's what we've seen really kind of exposed really, really broadly in the last two years. So I want to give the audience a, a, a chance to be able to find your article. The article that you wrote is called Nurses in Crisis Over COVID, Digging for Better Work Conditions. It's on khn.org, the Kaiser Health Network website. Check out the articles. Very, very riveting, very, very uh, deep in your in your dive as far as getting out the information, understanding what people are talking about. Because you see, you see traces of it in, 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 in the media, but it doesn't. people don't really go into as deep as what I've thought you've done. And what I've been looking for, trying to get research and information on this, one of the quotes in your article, which I thought was stuck out, and it was it was hard for me to really to really wrap my head around. And I quote this: "They make they they can make more at McDonald's." Speaking to the nurses working in some of these positions, so yeah, what, is, what does that mean? I can't wrap my head around that. So uh, uh, you telling me a, a registered nurse who's working for a company, working for a hospital, can, is could be better off at McDonald's? Well, uh, you know, and that, that that struck me as a little bit of, of hyperbole, um, but I think the, the the broader point was that at some point working at McDonald's, you could make as much as a nurse makes in a lot of these um, tougher situations. Now, a, you know, big um, there's an undertone to this uh, Kaiser Health News article, and that is, and, and it's really what we intended to explore, and that was the labor movement among uh, nurses in particular, and but healthcare workers more generally, and that is the movement toward unionization. That's really what had caught our interest because it, it appears to be on a rise in a way that we haven't seen in a long, long time. N- nurses are far more organized, uh, far more activist than they had been, and in almost every case, I have to be very specific, it's not the money that they're organizing around, although Without a doubt, anytime you're trying to negotiate a contract with a, a health uh, behemoth, uh, you know, industry giant, um, it helps to be organized. Otherwise, you have a chance to get run over. But they're really more talking about work conditions, being able to have, and, and the pandemic has really exposed this, being able to have adequate supplies of protective equipment, being able to uh, have adequate supplies of staff. Nurses often complain. Uh, that when they do complain, that is, they often, the nature of their complaint is that there aren't enough of them, that hospitals easily could hire more nurses, but don't, because they're trying to keep staff numbers down. They try to keep numbers of beds available down, because that drives profit higher. Mm. And anytime that's, you you know, sort of the basis of the conversation, you you know, you're already in trouble, right? That's where, that's where it is right now. Wow. So then, and this is a year right after the pen, at the, the of twenty twenty when um, a lot of money was flowing from different uh, everything from the federal level to private uh, private funding and even this patients paying record record profits for the healthcare industry. We're not talking about the pharmaceutical companies or the people that make the equipment to go in the hospital, but the hospitals themselves are they? The, how what's their financial uh, status now in this day and age? Are they doing okay? Can they afford to hire more nurses? What is the what is the pushback? Because it's hard to wrap your head around something where you say you want to believe that your local hospital is just greedy and not hiring people. Right. Yeah, and and I think it's too. You know, we we all tend to localize. Um, I think of my hospital as the hospital in town that I know, and because I do that. I tend probably more often than not not to link it up with its larger health system. But most hospitals aren't standalones. Most hospitals exist as part of larger health systems. And and to your point exactly, let me give you um, a a number. Kaiser Permanente, which is featured prominently in this story, um, from 2018 to 2020 had net revenue in just the three years, had net revenue of $6.8 billion dollars. But in the latest round of negotiations, tried to cut wages by 26 percent for any new hired nurses. So you can see that there's some cognitive dissonance going on there. And there are a number of of, a number of ways that these situations can be resolved. But what we're seeing and what we've reported at Kaiser Health News is that uh, in, in, in increasing numbers, these resolutions are now um, happening through union organization, uh, which forces a collective bargaining uh, 
situation, and, and it, more and more nurses have gravitated in that direction than, than we've seen, as I said, in a long time. But then you also write about that there's a lot of undermining being done by these behemoths because they're, they're actually doing all kinds of just really, just, just really underhanded things to try to disrupt their ability to actually organize or even just get their, their points across, even disrupting elections, all kind, this weird stuff. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's it, and it's really interesting. My my colleagues, um, and particularly Christine Spolar, who's the first name on on this story, uh, rightfully so. She did an amazing amount of work, but she was able to um, describe in our story several situations in which hospitals, either administratively or at the higher sort of um, executive administration level, have attempted to prevent organization from occurring. Um, we certainly saw in the very lengthy and um, surprisingly fractious negotiation between Kaiser and its nurses on the West Coast in California um, that Kaiser's negotiation was almost completely centered around a strategy that is an almost textbook page out of the book uh, uh, example of how to try and divide a union. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that, you know, in general, the hospital system's uh, which, after all, are you know profit-driven companies see the unions, and I sh I wouldn't say this is true completely across the board, but what we found was in surprisingly high numbers, they just view the unions as an unnecessary or as a nuisance, hmm. um, a a the kind of thing that's going to prevent them from uh, reaping the kind of profits that they seek. And then we also have the National Guard in some cases, even in here and um, and even local locally here in this area. In the Midwest, we've seen the National Guard actually being called in to assist um, in these hospitals to take some of the workload off. What's the effect of that? And then is that to offset people that might strike? Because that's the next question. So if nurses get to the point where they're fed up, especially with their lives at stake. I mean, I spoke to a nurse earlier today where he told me that he got COVID three times. Right. Yeah. So, so and that's and, it, it, Yeah. It's, it's, it, and that's, you know, so. Uh, I mean, it, it feels like the last option, right, would be a strike. I mean, there's no nurse among, as I said, the hundreds of nurses with whom I've spoken over the last couple of years uh, who would ever want to be off the job, who would ever want to walk off the job. Um, it's it's a last resort, and nurses were, in a couple of instances in, in the last year especially, were absolutely pushed very near the brink of that last resort, um, and that is – you know, I have to say, just to back up a step, though, you know, some of the stuff we're talking about, National Guard being called in, happened in, in states all over the country simply because the hospitals are understaffed, not because they were worried about, a, a, a you know, a labor uh, stoppage, but because they don't have the numbers in the first place. Mm. The, the, the truth of it is that in most settings, most hospitals are absolutely unprepared for any major emergency because they're built to be scaled down, not up. And it's very tough for hospitals to ramp up suddenly, and they're, they're, they're not lying when they say they can't bring in nurses fast enough because they've so understaffed or they plan for such a, a, a thin operation that, that it's tough to then rush in huge numbers of nurses because you've got to round them up from around the country. It's incredibly difficult to do. Now, is there a supply of nurses? Because I know one of the things we've talked about in this country right now, uh, the lack of skills versus job openings. So are there, is, there, is there a problem where there's just not enough skilled people? I mean, I know nursing is a huge field in, in the education where there is, and that's another conversation where we talk about for-profit versus not-for-profit education. Um, is right. that part of the issue, or is that something, is it something further going on? Is it strictly just the hospital is just, tr just trying to pinch every penny? Because it's not like you can just go to a temp agency and say, hey, I need some nurses. That's right. And, you know, it's interesting you say that because um, in, in across the country, there's a growing number of nurses who are called travel nurses. And essentially what a travel nurse does is instead of being based in a single hospital, they hire out to wherever a hospital is, is in crisis. And so they will go in sometimes for a few weeks, sometimes for a couple of months to a hospital that's having staffing shortages. Uh, but but and, and they and they are especially over the last two years, those travel nurses have been, you know, they've had money just thrown at them by hospital systems who can't bring in staff fast enough. Um, with that said, they account for only about two percent of the nurses in the country. So the, the, the largest picture is that 
the especially the unions and the nurses themselves would tell you that years and years of health systems having cut numbers is leading to a nursing shortage. Um, but they do not believe that there are actually not enough nurses to fill the jobs. They believe that there are not enough nurses willing to work under substandard conditions. The hospital associations, on the other hand, uh, maintain that they absolutely cannot hire enough nurses, that there's not enough of a talent pool. So there's a really a division of opinion on, on that. We have not seen strong evidence that there actually aren't enough nurses. I think our evidence would lead us to believe the former. There are enough nurses to fill these jobs if hospitals were serious about filling those jobs on a full-time basis. And you would think that if, if nurse if nurses were being hired, then you'd also create a demand for that for that skill set. So the people if people are seeing nurses getting work, because I've seen I mean I know nurses that are unemployed. You know that either because they, they because they don't want to take the risk of getting sick, or because of other issues or things like that, or the pay is just not what they thought it was going to be. Uh, people that have gone yeah. to you know for profit schools thinking they were going to get a career in nursing or career in the medical field and found out they 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 weren't qualified because of the fact that they just weren't properly trained, but yet still. You know, if, if they had an incentive, would go through the trouble of getting that corrected and, and getting into that work field. You know, so. Yeah, and, th- and there are strong indications that uh, nursing numbers and f- health worker numbers, for that matter, will rise. I think the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the federal bureau, um, has already made employment projections from here out through 2030. And registered nurses are among the – that's among the occupations expected to experience the greatest levels of job growth. Some of the others, though, are nurse practitioners, home health care aides, assistants, all part of this sort of health care system we're talking about. Where in, in, in this particular case, I think to, to be very specific, you know, when something like uh, COVID, it, it, you could, it could be some other health emergency. But since we're in this one, let's focus on COVID. What it does is drive record numbers of people to hospitals themselves. Those locations are absolutely understaffed uh, in, in, in many, many, many cases. And in those locations, what you've seen are nurses pushed to the edge, um, scheduled six and sometimes seven days a week. I spoke with many, many nurses who've been on six-day-a-week schedules for 12 or 15 months now. They have gotten sick, yes. They have gotten COVID. They've been taken out of work and then hurried back into work. They've often worked in situations where they didn't have enough personal protective equipment or PPE, the masks and gloves and things that they need to do their jobs. And so uh, a bunch of those nurses have left. They've just straight up left. They're either uh, considering other professions or they're sitting out for a little while. And it's an incredibly difficult situation. And I think that in many cases, nurses are burnt to a crisp. I've spoken with so many nurses who use the phrase burned out that I've really come to accept it. As a part of their existence these days, and do you see the uh, the the healthcare industry, the the people with the coffers? Do you see them lightening up or trying to work with nurses, or are they just digging in, you know, and becoming more entrenched in their profit margin? Well, I think in some of the in, in some of the smaller health systems that maybe are a little bit more um, nimble, able to make adjustments, you have seen uh, some movement. We've seen some uh, hospital systems, I should say, health systems negotiating good faith uh, with uh, nurses or even uh, step up immediately and negotiate with a a newly organized uh, nurse union. But boy, at the biggest levels, and now we're talking about the Giants and Kaiser and and Aetna and many others, that's just not the case. Kaiser's um, experience over this past year, an especially bitter experience, uh, ended ultimately on the brink of a strike. And really, the root of it all was that Kaiser, um, which has had labor peace with its, its all of its unions and all and really most of its workers for the better part of three decades, uh, had changed its very highest management a couple of years ago. Um, a really strong push toward reducing costs um, is sort of the ethos of the day, and they entered into a negotiation negotiation trying to install a two tier wage system and. What that means is that, uh, you know, if you're already a nurse, you keep the wage scale you're on. But for anybody who's hired from today on, they're going to come in and start at a much lower scale, meaning they will never catch up. Um, And in this case, it was a 26 percent cut. And what that does, it does two things. Obviously, saves costs. 
but it also causes people working in the same union to no longer be earning the same as fellow workers, which causes resentment and, and that's an old tactic by management, divides unions because it makes union employees, you know, angry with one another or at least angry with the system. Um, they took that right, and that had, that, that had never been brought forth by Kaiser ever in a negotiation. And they took it right up to the bitter end, right to the brink of the stoppage. The, work, the strike had already been authorized. Now we're talking about tens of thousands of nurses just in California walking off the job. It was averted at the last minute when Kaiser's management realized that the nurses weren't kidding. And they withdrew the, the proposal. Um, but for it to even, even got that far, it, you know, that's a, it's a tough signal. I mean, we're really talking about the business of health care and not the practice of health care. And that's kind of, kind of scary because even as a as a patient, it makes you think twice. When you if you're if you have the uh, the impression that you're going to a hospital that's designed to save your life, but in the middle of a pandemic where there's germs and everything flying around, even before the pandemic, I mean, there's things like MRSA and all kind of stuff that you could possibly get, and you have an understaffed medical facility that you're going to put your put your your care your life into somebody's care or a facility's care, and they're understaffed. Where you have maybe one nurse covering way too many patients. And if you have something yes. that needs a lot of attention, how do you have the confidence you're going to get the, the, the attention that you need in order to come out of that hospital in one piece? Yeah, it's a great question. And as consumers, we don't have a lot of choice. You know, this isn't a question that if I'm unhappy with one, you know, market, I might go to a different grocery store. But that is not the case here. And, and for most people, they're heading for wherever help is the closest. And uh, really, I think in this case, what we're talking about is really more of a chronic shortage um, with hospitals sort of always not quite prepared for this emergency. You know, uh, I spoke with a woman who um, runs the emergency uh, response, COVID response, for a large uh, hospital system in California uh, about a month ago, and we were talking about the lessons. This was when we realized Omicron was really going to come with full force. And I said, you know, what do you, what's been learned from the first Oh, you know, really heavy waves of COVID that'll help prepare for this wave. And she said, from a hospital standpoint, not much has changed. They'll they'll continue to be understaffed, and that just is a. It's not an equation that can get solved this minute because it was something that has been years in building. Wow. Now, is this common across the world, or is this something unique to the American healthcare system? Well, I would say almost everything about the American healthcare system is unique. You know, starting with the fact that it's, you know, for profit uh, and and in most of the, uh, you know, organized countries of the world, most of the uh, thoroughly developed countries of the world, health care is, if not free, it is largely a government provided service. So a lot of the most of what we talk about in health care in the United States is really very much unique to to our own country and our own lived experience right here. And it's very unusual. And. And this, you know, organizing movement that we've seen among nurses with more and more of them in more and a lot of times in difficult situations, uh, nevertheless, choosing to organize and to, and, and to become organized negotiating groups. It's a response to what they've seen happening over, you know, five, 10, now 15 years of, of steady reductions in staffing that leave them in a position where they believe as healthcare workers that just as you described, they can't properly care for the numbers of patients that they may be asked to care for. Hmm. It's really scary. And then what is the breaking point? So, you know, this, my next concern is, is that, okay, and we fast forward another 10 or 15 years, do we have a mass exodus or a, compete, a, a repeated draining of the talent and the, and the, uh, the, the nurses that are experienced leaving the workforce, leaving that industry? And then, and then because you're, you're lowering the pay scale, as you described earlier, are we getting less qualified nurses or are we going to wake up to a generation of less qualified nurses that are even even further strained because that's just what you can that's what they're willing to pay that's the that's the taker of the lowest wage yeah it, it, it's a great question the, the i think that uh because we're as i said we're really talking about the, sort of the profit business of healthcare. some of that will resolve on its own when hospitals are chronically understaffed then they have to start paying more um, and that's what we've seen during the crisis. Hospitals have paid astounding bonuses to nurses who are willing to come on board. They have paid astounding day rates or week rates to travel nurses who are willing to come from out of state and help them out for weeks or months at a time. 
and that is a trend that is likely to then encourage people, uh, more and more young people especially, to get into nursing. And so I do think, you know, as you, we talked about earlier, the job market is probably headed upward for the profession in general and for uh, healthcare workers in general because the demand is at a critical point. And with that comes, even if it's not what the companies want, uh, they ultimately have to raise wage in order to uh, even retain the staff they've got. So on that very, in that sort of small way, the market does resolve itself a little bit. My, my last question, we have about two minutes left. So what can we do as consumers to try to um, help this? Because this is a this is truly a, a crisis that affects everybody, not just nurses. It affects the, not just the bottom line for businesses, but it also affects the care that we receive in hospitals. So nurses are at risk uh, health-wise because if you're not getting prepared with the right equipment, the right PPE, all the different things that they need to do their job correctly, and, and especially if they're spread too thin. I mean, I'm thinking of, I mean, doctors in the state do 48-hour shifts and all kind of crazy stuff, which I never could wrap my head around. <laughs> why, why doctors? Yeah. Well, I mean, I understand why can't they get an eight-hour shift like everybody else, or a ten-hour shift even sure. would be wouldn't be that bad. But you got to be on twenty-four hours. They really want you to work on somebody at two o'clock in the morning when you haven't slept in twenty-four mm-hmm. hours. I don't get that. But I mean, nonetheless, yeah. I mean, what can we do as consumers and uh, to try and and to make this situation more feasible for everybody? Well, it, without a doubt, you know, I, an awful lot of us are buying our own health uh, insurance these days. Uh, probably more than ever. And with, you know, with the the Affordable Care Act still in place, uh, more people have come to the exchange to buy their insurance than ever before. And that does give you, although it's not satisfying, um, it does give you some measure of power because you can be a consumer. My advice would be examine those healthcare systems very carefully and try to invest your money because it, after all, it is your money flowing out the door in the form of what, you know, a premium or a copay or a deductible with a health uh, care company that stands for values and that supports its nurses and its doctors and its staff. And then at some point, we'll have that much bigger, much more difficult conversation about Medicare for all, which has been thought of as a really wild idea but for a long time. But I think in recent years has become a, a more and more sober question to ask. Why aren't we more like the rest of the countries in the world? Why can't I afford to be sick? It's a very fair question. Deserves an answer. Mark Reidler, thank you for your time. We appreciate you. Go on to khn.org, Nurses in Crisis Over COVID, Digging for Better Work Conditions. Our article is online now. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back.